Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. The last one, guys, that was bad. Thankfully, we survived long enough to enjoy a review of the long-awaited amazing Dino World, a rather recent Dino Doc produced by Japanese Public Broadcasting, NHK, along with Curiosity Stream. You know, that streaming service every nerd on YouTube gets paid to promote. I've never seen it for myself, though I know there's been a lot of hype around it over the past few years, but no more. I've seen it, and now I'm ready for a review. So, does Amazing Dino World live up to the hype? Does it hold up scientifically? Were all those YouTube promotions pure lies? Let's dig this up. Amazing Dino World. This is a good one. Not perfect, not the most accurate series I've ever seen, but good. We all know Tarbosaurus the Mightiest Ever is the indisputable best. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is our first good look at Dino Kyrus in these reviews. This genus made a brief appearance in Bizarre Dinosaurs, but as a Therizinosaurus wannabe since much of the body had yet to be described. Well, now we're in 2019, so things are looking up. Previously, all that was known were the huge set of arms, 2.4 meters long, tipped with massive claws. Discovered in 1965 and named in 1970, these giant arms, along with some other bits and pieces, were all that was known of this animal for decades. The long wait and later resurgence of more material is a great and complex tale. Ever since, scientists have been hunting for the rest of the skeleton to shed more light on its true form. A few moments later, it's been discovered, and now a complete skeleton of Dinochirus will be assembled for the first time. Oh, oh, we're just skipping it? Well, that sucks. Now this looks like a job for me. Some more material from the holotype was found by a group of paleontologists, including Phil Curie from the Royal Tyrell Museum back in 2012, but those bits will come up soon. 2013 saw the announcement of two new specimens, giving us a much better understanding. The first of the new stuff was a subadult found in 2006, unfortunately ruined by fossil poachers. The second was another large adult that was also ruined, found in 2009. Its skull, hands, and feet were already collected and sold on the black market, though other pieces were left over, such as a single toe bone. In 2011, strange skull, hand, and foot material was found in a private European collection. These were studied and thought to be Dinochirus remains, but not just from any Dinochirus, the foot was missing a single toe bone, and wouldn't you know it, the toe fragment from 2009 fit perfectly as that missing bone, so paleontologists were able to confirm that these fossils came from the exact same individual as the 2009 specimen. That skeleton was reunited. Oh, sorry, I wasn't supposed to discuss any of that, I guess. Oh well. What a fascinating story about a fascinating dinosaur. Now that we have all this new material, the Dinochirus resembles the Dinochirus here. Wow! What do you know? Curiosity and NHK truly brought these bones to life. Amazing Dino World accurately portrays it with this giant toothless beak, as is the case with other Ornithomimosaurians. Thomas Hulse once described the animal as a love affair between a Hadrosaurid and a Gallimimus. Can you see why? To make it even weirder, you gotta throw some Suchomimus into the mix because of those enlarged vertebrae that formed a massive hump or sail over the midsection. And who can forget those giant arms which began the story in the first place, shown here for grabbing branches and swiping down Tarbosaurus. Feathers are also a good inclusion. Okay, I know that just an episode ago I complained about large body theropods being indiscriminately coated in fluff. Now here I am becoming the very thing I swore to destroy? Well, not exactly. Other ornithomimosaurians have been found to possess feathers, but for Dinochirus specifically, experts have noted a condition in which the final caudal vertebrae are fused, creating a single ossified mass at the tip of their tail. This feature, called a pygostyle, is often found in birds to support a tail fan. 
So in my opinion, it makes sense to show them fluffy, though maybe I'm splitting hairs. I like how Amazing Dino World gets their diet down too. Stomach contents from Dino Kyrus have been found with surprising results. Over a thousand gastroliths were present, indicating a need to grind down plants, but also present were fish scales and vertebrae. They were the OG pescatarians. This strange dinosaur's strange diet is highlighted perfectly here. Even their environment is done well. Dinochirus is found in the Namek formation along with Tarbosaurus and Xanabazar. Many other lovely inhabitants also roam but are sadly not included. But it is represented as a lush seasonal floodplain with lots of wooded areas. Don't mix this up with the earlier Jaducta formation's desert biome cause I made that mistake once. Now, I have to mention the presence of grass in the first episode. Of all the science and all the debate and all the flaws, who would guess that grass is one of the most controversial, the stuff that cows eat? Scientists used to think that grasses first appeared during the Eocene about 55 million years ago. Now we know they already diversified throughout the Cretaceous. That they look exactly like someone shot a dino dock in their backyard? Maybe not, but their inclusion is reasonable. Maybe you don't want to spend your nights reading about grass diversification, but with recent fossil evidence, the earliest grasses have been dated to the early Cretaceous Albion stage, allowing for the appearance of derived rice-like grasses by the end of the Cretaceous. So maybe these lawn-like grasses began appearing around here too. I don't know, I'm reading too much into this. Grass is weird. Now, I did mention more Dino Kyrus material described in 2012. These fragments included belly ribs or gastralia. On these gastralia were bite marks, identified as the handiwork of Tarbosaurus, the large tyrannosaur that stalked Maastrichti in Mongolia. They are shown eating Dino Kyrus, which is accurate. How we got here is questionable. Did a pack of them really need to slaughter an entire family and orphan our main subject like Batman? No, but the eating part is accurate. The Mosasaurus episode is a good time too. It's good, not great. Dino World hits some of those key points I've mentioned in Sea Monsters and Sea Monsters. We see that nice counter shading and that upper tail fin made of soft tissue. Rather than having a tadpole like tail, you can tell they were going the shark approach, just upside down. I wanna turn the whole thing upside down. The live births were also a neat touch. Yeah, they were lizards and likely started off by laying eggs, but as they adapted to life in the open seas, adapted by giving birth to live young so they wouldn't be tied to the land to lay eggs. There is actual fossil evidence to support this with juvenile fossils found in open sea deposits. Paleontologists in the show reveal the skeleton of a pregnant Carsosaurus with preserved fetuses. Seeing how this was a semi-aquatic basal mosasauroid tells us how viviparousness, viviparosity, developed early on in this lineage, shown with the proto-mosasaurus. Yeah, we'll get to that. If I were to nitpick anything, this model doesn't look streamlined enough and the head feels a little shrink wrapped, kind of like a Nile monitor that just ventured into the ocean rather than a true Mosasaurus. Perhaps this is part of the model and I'm just not looking close enough, but we never see any Terry Gord teeth, that extra row on the roof of the mouth. We're not quite at xenomorph levels, but still pretty bad donkey. And so far, no documentary has shown us a forked tongue mosasaurid. This documentary does nicely state how they descended from close relatives of monitor lizards and snakes. So unlike dinosaurs, they're actual lizards. Why not go the extra mile and show some forked tongue action? I guess they're too unbelievable. Still pretty good overall, but we were on the verge of greatness. It appears greatness must wait. There are a few other positives to mention. The pterosaur as Darko is shown with pycno fibers, small filamentous structures that may have been homologous with feathers, meaning they came from a common fluffy archosaur ancestor, rather than appearing independently in pterosaur and dinosaur lineages. I always enjoy looking at extant animals. Seeing how smart some parrot species are is great and not actually exaggerated. Some parrots and crows display problem solving capabilities better than seven year olds. Better than some adults I've met too, for sure. 
So that's actually accurate, though I'm not sure it's fair to transfer the extreme intelligence of a few modern birds to troodontids 70 million years ago. The actual viviparous, or live birthing shingleback lizard, was another fun detail. This isn't a feature only reserved for mammals, but has appeared many times in the animal kingdom. Okay, I'm done. Any other compliments I can briefly give along the way? In a strange turn of events, we're only three years away from the present. After making these documentary reviews for nearly two years now, that's hard for me to swallow. So after I review Prehistoric Planet, I'll loop back around to discuss some of the ones I missed. But this means there's not too much to say here. We're briefly introduced to the 2014 interpretation of Spinosaurus, which tells me they actually care about recent developments, even if said developments are questionable to say the least. Again, I always thought it was a dumb idea, so thankfully the science caught up with my suspicions. But that's simply not possible. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid? We've been over Spinosaurus many times before on the channel, since now we have a much better understanding of what it looked like. I'm sure more challenges will come, but whatever. Just don't get a Spinosaurus tattoo, cause that crap ain't gonna last. And the other outdated tidbit is about another aquatic theropod. We're talking Halscaraptor, a dromaeosaur described as recently as 2017 after being another victim to fossil poaching in Mongolia. Features of this genus have been viewed as indicative of a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Neurovascular canals on the tip of the snout forming these crocodile-like sensory pits, a long neck, slightly flattened forelimbs, and a flattened snout like a duck are each presented as evidence. The popular image was a dromaeosaurid or raptor dinosaur that evolved into a cretaceous duck. Because we're still in the outdated, you can already guess how this panned out. Paleontologists have come forward to refute this hypothesis, arguing that the many morphologies thought to point to a semi-aquatic lifestyle don't and are really just the result of its placement as a basal dromaeosaurid, so it shared many similarities to other basal members of other manoraptorid lineages. The earlier branching raptor shares traits with basal therizinosaurids, troodontids, ornithomimosaurians, and even early birds like Archaeopteryx. Nothing here actually indicates a duck raptor. Heck, even more recently in that 2022 bone density paper, Halscaraptor was shown to have more hollow bones like terrestrial dinosaurs rather than the more dense bones of swimming Spinosaurus. So unfortunately, this appearance doesn't hold up. Amazing Dino World is one of those cursed documentaries that has so much good, yet so much bad. Some depictions like Troodons are better than any that came before, even if they're still called Troodon. But then, then there's a ton of crap to ruin it. Please, either be really good or really bad. Be hot or cold, not a disgusting lukewarm. Like usual, we are subjected to time jumping as creatures appear earlier or later than they should. There's the typical Jaducta Namek mishmashing as Campanian dinosaurs just refuse to die off in the Mastrictian, such as Protoceratops and Halscaraptor. Hadrosaurus should have disappeared like 78 million years ago, but was literally too angry to die, so it appears at the very end of the Cretaceous with T Rex. As Darko appears in Africa about 100 million years ago, uh, 8 million years too early. Abelosaurus stomps through the same setting, yet lived 80 million years ago in South America. Mosasaurus itself jumped backwards to 95 million years ago to fight Spinosaurus. Sure, some smaller mosasaurids were moving into the water at this time, but we wouldn't see that gigantic predators appear until about 10 million years later. Sorry, it's meant to be cool. You're not allowed to question it. Please continue to mindlessly consume media. Some behaviors work well, like live mosasaurus birth, child rearing, and heck, I don't even complain about intelligent troodon, because there aren't many reliable sources on dinosaur intelligence I can find. Some behaviors though, just seem really, really dumb, like how a single Tarbosaurus assaults a healthy, well-armed, and larger Dinochirus. A pack of the Namek troodontid, Xana Bazaar, went straight into the arms of the dino to get her eggs, rather than running away from the angry six-ton clawed behemoth. Uh, 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 uh. And 
when a Pachyrhinosaurus is confronted by a measly little Alaskan troodontid, the narrator literally says, Pachyrhinosaurus are herbivores. They wouldn't attack Troodon. Bruh, you're telling me that herbivores are always peaceful? Have you heard of bulls or rhinos or elephants? or buffalo, or maybe the most deadly African mammal, which is not the lion, not the hyena, not the leopard, but the godforsaken hippopotamus. And they're trying to tell me that Pachyrhinosaurus was this pushover pacifist. Oh god, why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> oh my god, my insides are on fire! I mentioned how I like some of their paleo portrayals already. A lot of them are excellent, while others are just bad. I have no clue what the deal is with T-Rex here. The ugly evolutionary journey models reused here, and sometimes it's a copy-paste job, and other times we get an emo black version of it, and then we get a featherless version. I want to insult all of them at once, but I don't know how. Tarbosaurus 2 is made in the same style, which clearly isn't a good thing, a Bellosaurus has arms too long and developed, but also a feathery coat. A Bellosaurus are probably the worst theropods to include feathers on. We've known of their scaly coverings for decades. The whole feather craze was too alluring, I guess. And that brings us to the worst design here, and among the worst in any film, the giant horned Pachyrhinosaurus. I'm going to die! I thought the JFC one was bad, cause it is, but this is insanity. It's like when one person commits an unspeakable crime that I don't want to be demonetized for naming, so then a copycat tries to outdo them with their own crime. Come on, at least be original in your terribleness. Very obviously, Pachyrhinosaurus had a big bony boss over its nose. The name is literally Greek for thick nosed lizard. Why would anyone want to assassinate this incredible creature? Curiosity and NHK also went overboard on the fuzz. Again, Paki is given this thick coat of down for warmth when we have direct fossil evidence in Centrosaurines telling us otherwise. There are a few more details to cover. This clutch of giant eggs found in China's Henan province is said to belong to a species of oviraptor, which is a total butchering of classifications. I highly doubt that any species of oviraptor existed that was large enough to lay such huge eggs. It may have been an oviraptor in genus, but not another oviraptor species. More classification problems come with this cladogram shown in episode 2 that hurts my soul. I mean, firstly, the writers make up a new genus named Protomosasaurus. Come on guys, was that really necessary? You could have used Agialosaurus or Dallasaurus instead and still have gotten the same message across. As long as the narrator was careful with their language, not calling them direct Mosasaurus ancestors, it could have worked. Secondly, it's confusing as all Shrek. If interpreted the wrong way, you can walk away with tons of misinformation. Are dinosaurs being considered crocodilians? Are crocodiles considered dinosaurs? Why are there lizards, then lizards and snakes? Aren't snakes technically lizards too, since they descended from true lizards? So it's basically lizards, and weird lizards? And then Plesiosaurus is listed as an offshoot of lizards and snakes. This is wrong. All wrong, or at least very misleading. Alright, let's wrap this up so I can talk about Prehistoric Planet already. I feel like Curiosity tried, they put a lot of effort into this one, but at the same time drove straight into Paleo landmines. I swear, there was a brilliant creator here, and then his evil twin who snuck in to sabotage everything. He animated nose horns on all those poor packies. This makes grading hard. Does the good outweigh the bad? How much bad can be ignored when there's loads of great information? It pains me to do this, there's a lot to love here, but in my opinion, Amazing Dino World deserves a B-. This was a fun one, I'm glad the fans requested it because I've never seen it before. Amazing Dino World is a good time, even if, scientifically, it's not one of the greats. This brings us to the finale of a very long season of Dino Doc reviews, Prehistoric Planet from just a few months ago. Oh man, I smell a two-parter coming. Remember, if you enjoyed this video to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.